Yesterday we looked at the existence of God. Today we're going to ask the question, uh, what kind of God exists? There are many different views of God, and we'd like to take a look at an illustration of each of them. First of all, there's theism, and theism is the belief that there is a God beyond the world who created the world, but he is as different from the world as a painter is from a painting. The second illustration is deism. Deism is the belief that there is a God beyond the world, but he does not interfere with the world. He does not perform miracles in the world. Then there's the uh, view called finite Godism, that there is a small, a finite God beyond the world, but he's not all-powerful. He's not in absolute control of the world, and he is limited by the evil uh, that's in the world. Then there's polytheism, the belief that there are many gods, each of which, of course, is finite, that are interacting with the world. Then there's the view called pantheism, which says uh, the world is God, and God is the world, or God is all, and all is God. And, of course, atheism, that says there's a world and no God. The view that we're expounding is the view called theism. There is an infinite God beyond the world who made the world, he created it, he brought it into existence, and he intervenes from time to time to perform miracles in the world. In order to know by reason and uh, human reason alone what kind of God uh, this is, we need to look back at the arguments that we presented in favor of the existence of God. First of all, you remember there was the cosmological argument that says uh, the creation shows there is a creator, uh, every effect has a cause. The cosmos uh, has a beginning. Therefore, there must have been a beginner. Now, this argument shows that God is powerful because if he was able to produce the world, he had to have the power to do it. In fact, if he was able to create something from nothing, he had to have all power. He had to be an all-powerful God to make something out of nothing. Nothing comes from nothing, but someone, God, created something out of uh, nothing, and this was an all-powerful act of the Creator. Then, of course, there was the argument that every design has a designer, every composition has a composer. This is the teleological argument, and it tells us that God is intelligent. Uh, life manifests intelligence. Specified complexity is found even in the smallest creatures in the sea. So that God is an intelligent creator because of the marvelous plan, order, structure that he has produced in his universe. The moral argument says every moral law has a moral law giver. And of course, if there is a moral law, then there must be a moral law giver. And God himself must be the ultimate standard of morality. He has to be absolutely perfect, uh, the basis for all values. So those three arguments tell us that there is an all-powerful uh, super intelligent, absolutely perfect moral standard uh, for the universe. The ontological argument, while it did not prove the existence of God, uh, did nevertheless show that God must be an absolutely perfect being, an absolutely necessary being. You remember St. Anselm said, uh, if you can think of an absolutely perfect being, he must exist, because if you thought of him as not having existence, he uh, wouldn't be absolutely perfect. And while that argument isn't valid, it certainly is valid to say that God must be the absolutely perfect being, uh, because if he lacked any perfection, uh, he wouldn't be the ultimate. And the very fact that we know things are more or less perfect presupposes a most perfect. The very fact that we can say this is not a perfect circle presupposes that we have an idea of what a perfect circle is. Something cannot fall short of a standard unless we know what the standard is from which it falls short. So God must be an absolutely perfect, being the basis of all perfection. Also, he has to be absolutely necessary. That is, he cannot not exist. If there is a God, he must exist. If there is a triangle, it must have three sides. And if there is a necessary being, it must exist necessarily. The only way... God could exist is to exist necessarily. If he came to be, he wouldn't be God. Something else would have caused him to come to be. So what we can infer from these arguments for the existence of God is a, an all-powerful, 
all intelligent, absolutely morally perfect, absolutely necessary being uh, who created the universe. Now, there are a number of other things we can learn about God simply by unpacking these attributes of God that we've already learned from what is called general revelation from a Christian standpoint or what is known of as nature or human reason. We can also learn that God is unique, that he's absolutely one, uh, because God is an unlimited being. He has unlimited power. Everything that is limited has a limiter. Everything that is finite has a creator, and the creator could not be finite, so the creator must be infinite. If every finite has a cause, then the cause of every finite thing cannot be finite. If it were finite, it would need a cause. Therefore, the cause of all finite things must be infinite, must be unlimited. But how many unlimited beings can you have? You can only have one. Uh, God is an unlimited being. You cannot have two uh, infinite beings. You would have to have uh, a difference between them, and since uh, they're both infinite, there's no way to have a difference between them. Or to put it uh, in a different way, God is a class of one because he's an all-perfect being. You cannot have two absolutely perfect beings. To have two things, one must differ from the other. Uh, for one to differ from the other, one would have to have something the other one doesn't have. But if one doesn't have it, then it lacks it. If it lacks it, it wouldn't be all perfect. So you can't have two all-perfect beings. One would lack a perfection, and it wouldn't be all perfect. If you had uh, two beings that were entirely identical in every respect, they would be one. For example, if you had two pins, uh, the two pins couldn't be identical. You say, well, uh, they could be the same shape. But if you looked under a microscope, they'd be a little different shape. And even if under a microscope they had the same shape, this would be made of uh, this metal and that pin would be made of that metal, they wouldn't be the same pins. You say, well, what if both pins were made of the same metal and had the same shape and the same size, had the same molecules in them? Then, of course, you only have one pin. So you can only have one God. You can only have one ultimate. You can't have two alls. You can't have two infinite beings, and you cannot have two all-perfects. There must be only one infinite, powerful, intelligent, absolutely morally perfect being uh, who is the cause of all things that exist. Now, this leads us to another conclusion about uh, this God. Uh, God must be the Lord over all creation. Uh, if he created it, he is the Lord of it. He is sovereign over it. Uh, simply by human reason alone, we can conclude that if this world came into existence from nothing, and someone made it out of nothing, that someone who made it is in absolute control over it because he brought it into existence, he's holding it into existence. It exists only because he continues to cause it to exist, just like uh, the blocks are held up by the hand uh, and the chain is held up by the peg. So uh, God is the one holding the universe into existence right now, simultaneous causality. When you look in a mirror, you see an image of your face, you are the cause of that image, and if you weren't there, the image wouldn't be there. Uh, and if God was not holding the world up, the world wouldn't be there right now. You move yourself from the mirror, and the image isn't in there. And in like manner, God is causing the existence of the world right now. So if he is the cause of the existence of the world right now, if he brought it into existence in the past, he must be Lord or sovereign over creation. There's another attribute of God that we want to uh, discuss a little bit, and that's the attribute of God's infinity. Uh, he is unlimited. We alluded to it earlier. If every finite being needs a cause, if everything that's limited needs a cause, then the cause cannot be finite because every finite being needs a cause, and if everyone that is finite needs a cause, and God were finite, he would need a cause too. So the first cause must be not finite, not limited in any way. Every limited thing needs a limiter. Every finite thing needs an infinite cause to account for it. Every cause that is caused needs a cause that isn't caused to account for it. In other words, God must be the uncaused cause of every cause that exists. 
So God is infinite. He is without limits. He has uh, no boundaries placed upon him. We're talking about an absolutely unique, one, single being who is sovereign over all creation, who brought it into existence, intelligent, powerful, moral, and who is infinite in every respect. Now this means that if God is infinite in his being, then God, of course, cannot be in any way limited. He must be infinitely knowing. If God knows anything, he has to know in accordance with his own being. So he would have to know infinitely. If God is good, he would have to be good in accordance with his own infinite being, so he would have to be infinitely good. If he's perfect, he would have to be perfect in accordance with his very nature. And since his nature is infinite, he would have to be infinitely perfect. This means that God is not a finite God, as some say. He's not struggling with the world. He's all powerful, because if he has power, he would have to have infinite power. He would have to have unlimited power. Now, the power we know, such as physical energy in the universe, is running down. Uh, the amount of available energy is decreasing. So the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the universe can't be God. The universe can't be God because it's running out of energy, and God is unlimited in energy. God is eternal and uncreated uh, energy. He is Lord over creation. He is infinite. He's infinite in every way. He's infinite in his knowledge. If he knows anything, he must know in accordance with his being, and his being is infinite. So he has infinite knowledge, infinite power, infinite wisdom, infinite goodness. Uh, he is infinite in every respect. One of the uh, attributes of God that uh, emerges from this is called aseity, spelled A-S-E-I-T-Y. Uh, aseity is the attribute of self-existence, that God is the self-existent one. He is the one who doesn't depend on anything else for his existence. This can be easily seen when you think of what a creature really is. A creature is a dependent being. We depend for our existence on something else. But everything can't depend. Something has to be independent on which everything else depends. A creature is a contingent being. But everything can't be contingent. Something has to be necessary. Uh, in other words, everything can't come to be and cease to be. Something just has to be. Uh, if there weren't something there to exist, when things come into existence and go out of existence, then something would be able to come from nothing. But nothing cannot produce something. It takes something to produce something. So everything that came to be came to be by something that always was, always existed, and must necessarily exist. Or to state it in another way, there are some things that are maybes. We exist, but we might not exist. If there are things that are maybes, then there must be a must be, something that must exist by its very nature. God is this necessary uh, existence. Everything that is caused is dependent on something that is ultimately uncaused. So God is the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover. He is the self-existent one. That's exactly what God said to Moses in the Bible, you remember. He said, I am that I am. Moses said, who are you, Lord? Explain so I can declare your name to the people of Israel. And God said, I am that I am. Now, he didn't say, I am what I am, because uh, that would be true of a human being. I am what I am. I am human. That's what I am. But God said, I am that I am. I am pure existence. I am self-existing. I am totally self-sufficient. Uh, he is the Yahweh of the Bible. Now, what I would like to do now is to make a transition from this God of reason to the God of revelation. Sometimes you hear an objection that really doesn't make too much sense, and the objection goes like this. The God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not uh, the God of human reason or the God of the philosophers. What has Athens to do with uh, Jerusalem? Well, Athens and Jerusalem at this point become absolutely one. You see, God has revealed himself both uh, in uh, nature and in scripture. He has revealed himself in uh, his son, Jesus Christ, the, the living revelation, but he's also revealed himself in the natural world of creation. Romans chapter 1 tells us that the creation points to the creator and all men are without excuse. 
Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. God is uh, revealed both in general revelation and in special revelation. Now the question is this, the God uh, of human reason that we have just discussed, who is infinite, one, uh, intelligent, morally perfect, is that the same as the God of the Bible? Are we talking about two different beings? And the answer is, they're one and the same. Why? Because you can't have two infinites. The God of human reason, as we saw, must be an infinite, unlimited being, absolutely perfect. And the God of the Bible is revealed, as we'll see in a moment, as infinite, self-existing, absolutely perfect. And you can't have two infinite beings. In order to have two beings, one has to differ from the other. But they're both infinite. They're both all. Uh, one would have to have a perfection, the other didn't have it. As we saw, you can't have something with a perfection the other one doesn't have because the other one that doesn't have it wouldn't have all perfections and therefore wouldn't be God. So the God of the Bible and uh, the God of uh, the theism, the God of the cosmological argument are one and the same. Let's take a look at the God of the Bible and we'll see some of the attributes of this God and how they parallel, indeed are identical, to the attributes we have just seen in this God of human reason. First of all, in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, uh, Yahweh said, I am who I am. The God of the Bible is self-existing, uncaused, absolutely necessary, which is exactly what we saw the God of of human reason to be. The God of the uh, scriptures has a number of non-moral attributes and then he has a number of moral attributes. The non-moral attributes deal with things like God is immaterial, uh, God is infinite, God is necessary, and the moral attributes deal with things like God's love or his kindness, his mercy, and his grace. Let's first of all look at God's non-moral attributes. The Bible says that God is immaterial. He's not made out of matter. He's not made out of any stuff the universe is. He's not made out of physical energy. God is not to be identified with the physical universe. In John chapter 1, verse 18, we read, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. God is literally invisible. No one can see God with their naked eyes. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is an invisible spirit. Jesus said, uh, I have flesh and bones. I am not a spirit in his human nature. So a spirit doesn't have flesh. What is flesh is not a spirit. God does not have flesh. God does not have a body. God is simply an invisible spiritual being. The Bible declares uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, who hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man approaches unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. God is immortal, invisible God. Also the scriptures tell us that God is one. Now you remember the God of human reason from the cosmological and teleological and moral arguments uh, turned out to be one because he was absolutely unique and infinite. Well, the God of Scripture is one. Deuteronomy 6.4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Apostle Paul repeated this in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Christianity is a monotheistic religion. It affirms the one true God and says the Lord our God is one. Just as the God of human reason was absolutely one and unique, so the God of divine revelation is absolutely one and unique. The scriptures also say that God is indivisible. He has no parts. He's not composed. 
uh, that would follow from God's spiritual nature. You can cut something that is material in two, but you can't cut a spirit in two. Spirit has no parts to cut into, and what has no parts cannot be torn apart. God is spirit, and therefore he cannot be torn apart. Uh, John 4.24, Acts 17.29, the Apostle Paul said, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stones graven by art and man's device. Paul said, if you think of it, we are intelligent beings, uh, we have minds, we shouldn't think of God as being a stone. A stone can't uh, produce a mind. There are really only two basic beliefs in the world, either matter produce mind or mind produce matter. Now, matter can't produce mind. Uh, matter doesn't have any intelligence. It takes intelligence to produce intelligence. Uh, it takes mind to produce mind. So God is mind. God is spirit. God is the one who uh, is indivisible because of his very spiritual nature. Romans chapter 1, verse 23. It says the pagans change the glory of the uncorruptible God into corruptible things like four-footed uh, beasts. So God is the uncorruptible, indivisible, absolutely spiritual being. The Bible also tells us that God is infinite. He's without limitations. And this accords also with what we learn from human reason, which is really God's general revelation to all men. Genesis uh, chapter 17, verse 1, And when Abraham was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. God is almighty. He's not limited in his power. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Absolutely nothing is too hard for him because he is unlimited in his powerful resources. Psalm 147 verse 5 says, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. We have an infinite God with infinite understanding and infinite power. Now, the God that we learned about through general revelation was infinite. The God of the Bible, special revelation, is infinite. They're one and the same God. The God we learned about through human reason was one. The God of the Bible is one. So they're one and the same God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of the philosophers if the philosophers are thinking correctly. And as we reason about the existence of God, we can discover also that God is unchangeable. This is exactly what the Bible tells us. Malachi 3.6 For I am the Lord, I change not, and therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. I am the Lord, and I change not. God is an unchangeable being. See, in order to change, you have to have something that remains the same and something that can change. Otherwise, no change is possible. You have to have parts in order to change. But God has no parts, so God cannot change. God is a simple, indivisible, immutable being. He is changeless. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12 declares, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. God doesn't change because he laid the foundation of the earth, and the earth changes, but he remains the same. He is the same from the beginning. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, we read in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. The book of James in chapter 1, verse 17, has a good description of God's immutability, his unchangeableness. It says, Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You've noticed uh, in watching a shadow that you cannot see your shadow change in the sun. If you're standing still or watching a sundial, you can't see the sundial move because it moves imperceptibly, but it does move. And so God is 
the God who doesn't even change like a sundial, who doesn't change like a shadow. He, he is absolutely unchangeable, and therefore we can completely trust in him. Now, the unchangeableness of God is an attribute that's very fascinating because if God can't change and everything else that changes in uh, respect to God is relative and God is absolute. Uh, Albert Einstein talked about the theory of relativity, but he believed that there was an absolute spirit, absolute God to which everything was relative. Perhaps you've had the experience of uh, being in a car or an automobile and looking over at another one next to you and you can't tell whether that one's moving or your car is moving. Well, if you look at a tree, a fixed point, then you can measure which one is moving. But if the tree is moving, then you don't know who's moving forward or backwards. Everything can't be moving. Something has to be fixed so that we can see and measure change by it. Now, the change in this world is measured by the unchangeable God. God is the unchangeable fixed point by which we can measure everything else. God is like a pillar. The man can stand on the right side of the pillar and move to the left side of the pillar. When he does, the pillar doesn't move, just the man has moved. We move in relationship to God, but God does not move in relationship to us. Now, it is true that the Bible talks about God changing, God repenting. But it's something like this. If you are on a bicycle going against the wind and you say, the wind is against me, and you turn around and you say, the wind is for me, the wind hasn't changed. You have with respect to the wind. And God seems for people who are going uh, in his will, and he seems against people who are going against his will. God hasn't changed. He's still the same consistent God. It is we who have changed uh, in respect to God. The Bible also says God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Now, we learned, you remember, from human reason that if God uh, created an intelligently patterned world, he must be intelligent. And if God created a finite world, he must be infinite. And if he's infinite and intelligent, he must be infinitely intelligent. That's another way of saying God knows everything. God is omniscient or all-knowing. In the Bible, it's declared in these terms, Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising, and thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compasseth my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. God knows everything. He knows when I sit down. He knows when I stand up. He knows what's in my heart. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13 says, All things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God sees into the very depth of our heart. He is an all-knowing being. You can't have two all-powerful, all-knowing, absolutely necessary beings. There is only one. And the God of the Bible holds people responsible who don't know the Bible because he has made these truths available to all men because he has declared them from creation. He has written them in the hearts of men. Psalm 19, Romans 1, Romans 2, Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 17, all of these passages of the Bible declare this God to all men. God is also omnipotent or all-powerful according to the Bible. Job 42, 2. I know that you can do everything and that no thought can be withheld from you. you remember Job came to the conclusion that God was all-powerful and that he was in control of the whole universe he was in control of the devil, of the forces of evil. He was in control of every detail of Job's life, even permitting the tragedy that happened to him and bringing the greater good out of it. God is all-powerful. Jeremiah 32:17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for you. Absolutely nothing 
is too hard for God because he can do anything that's possible to do. He is literally an all-powerful, omnipotent God. The Bible also has another non-moral attribute of God. It's called uh, omnipresence. God is everywhere present. God is here. Uh, God is over there. God is in outer space. Uh, God is in the depth of the sea. Uh, the psalmist put this in a, a very beautiful way in Psalm 139, uh, verses 7 to 10. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up in heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I were to take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me and thy right hand will hold me. God is literally everywhere. God is spirit and as spirit he encompasses everything. God knows everything. God is all powerful and God is everywhere present. The three omnis. Um, nigh knowing or omniscient, omnipotent or all-powerful, omnipotent, uh, omnipresent, everywhere present. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 and 24 say, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? God fills heaven and earth. He's everywhere at all times. From these attributes, there's another attribute that emerges, and that's called the majesty of God. In Psalm 8.1, we read, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. God is a majestic God. Now, he would have to be majestic if he's all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, it has the ability to be everywhere at the same time and is exalted above the universe, the creator of all things, absolutely perfect, then, of course, he would have to be a majestic God. And Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 12 states this very clearly. Who has measured the water in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span? and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in the balance. God is the one who holds us in the palm of his hand. He's the creator of all things and the provider of every living thing. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16, it declares, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. There in the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus, who is God in human flesh, was transfigured before them, they saw the majesty of God. His absolute purity and holiness was declared forth. Uh, God is a majestic being. Following from this is another very significant attribute of God. Sovereignty. God is supreme over all. God is the supreme ruler of the universe. Man may rule, but God overrules. Uh, man may propose, but God ultimately disposes of all things. Uh, God is sovereign over the entire universe. Psalm 11, verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold his eyelids try the children of men. God is in his holy temple. He is in his sovereign, exalted place. And the invisible God is ruling this visible universe. We read in uh, Psalm 104, verse 19, He appointed the moon for seasons, and the sun knows his going down. God has appointed all of the stars uh, in space. He has appointed everything in this universe to declare his power and majesty. In Romans 9, uh, verse 20 and verse 21, we have one of the most powerful declarations of God's sovereignty anywhere in the Bible. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing form? Say to him that formed it, Why have you made me thus? 
Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another to dishonor? You know, sometimes we question God, but he's the master potter, and the master potter uh, makes some kind of vases for one purpose and other kind of vases for another purpose. He is the master painter, and the master painter paints the beautiful mountain, and he also paints the raging sea. All of this are part of God's great plan for this world because he is sovereign over all things. Now this gives us a list then of God's non-moral attributes. Uh, his infinity, his necessity, his simplicity, his omnipresence, his omnipotence. Uh, God in his non-moral character is of course not only revealed in scripture but is revealed to human understanding in nature and in the hearts and lives of human beings. But what about God's moral attributes? Uh, is God a moral being? Does he have attributes that uh, depict a moral character? We saw that this is true from the moral argument because the moral argument says every moral law has a moral law giver. And we saw this is also true from perfection because God has to be absolutely perfect if there are things more or less perfect, there has to be a standard which is absolutely perfect by which we can measure them. But what does the Bible say about his moral attributes? It says God has holiness, complete righteousness, Isaiah 6, verse 3. And one angel cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The angels sing the church sanctus, holy, 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 in the very presence of God. He is absolutely perfect. Habakkuk 1.13 says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. God is so pure that he can't even look upon evil in any approving way. 1 John 1.5 This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He is pure, unadulterated light, uh, light with no darkness at all in it. These are ways of describing God's holiness. The great uh, verse of Scripture, I am holy, be ye holy, from the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 11. God is also justice. He is absolutely fair. He does to each according to it's due. Psalm 19.9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He is not unfair nor unjust in his judgments. Zephaniah 3.5 says, the just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will do no iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his righteous judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knows no shame. Every morning, God brings his justice to light. And in Romans chapter 2, when Paul was talking about the pagan world and how they had fallen away from God, he says in verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. God is fair. God is just. Uh, these are part of the moral attributes of God. Holy and just God. He's also jealous. This is a very interesting attribute because what is a sin for us is one of God's very attributes. How can that be? What is jealousy? Why is God a jealous God? Well, first of all, jealousy means that God is an all-consuming God. He has an all-consuming a concern for his own supremacy. He protects religiously who he is against anyone who would try to be his equal. He is the sovereign, supreme creator of the universe. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God, and I am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. 
God is described as a jealous God. He's so holy and he's so protective as, of his holiness that he visits uh, the sins upon generation after generation. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, we read that jealousy is a very attribute of God. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealousy is a jealous God. Capital J, Jealousy. God is a jealous God, and he will zealously protect his own holiness in order to preserve the integrity of the universe. If God doesn't stand up for what's absolutely right, who is? And he is the absolute standard for rightness. So what is wrong for us? namely to be jealous of what someone else has, is not wrong for God because he possesses it. He is the ultimate. He is the standard of righteousness and holiness, and therefore for him it is absolutely right to protect his own jealousy. The Bible also declares that God is perfect. He has absolute perfection, flawless, excellent. Deuteronomy 32.4 he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. God is so perfect he never makes any mistakes. He is flawless in his character. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We've got a perfect God. He's the standard of all else. He's the ruler by which we measure. When sin is declared in the Bible, in Romans 3, it says, All have sinned and fallen short. Falling short assumes that there's a standard from which we are falling. God is that perfect standard. Another one of God's moral attributes is truthfulness. He's completely trustworthy and consistent. You can count on God. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God said it, you can trust it. If God declared it, it is true. He is truth, and he declares the truth. In Romans chapter 3, and verse 4, it says, God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Now, there are people who think that God has lied and they are uttering the truth. The Bible says God is truth and man is uttering a lie. A lie is what falls short of the truth. God is that standard by which we can measure what is wrong. Jesus himself, who is the declaration of God, said, I am the truth. Truth is what corresponds to reality. Jesus was that truth that corresponded to the Father. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, because the Son declares the Father. God is not only an infinite being, but he is infinitely perfect in his character. God is not only a necessary being, but he is a truthful being absolutely truthful in what he says. Another one of God's moral attributes is omnibenevolence or all loving. You know, it might be kind of fearful to look at a God who is infinite and omniscient, who knows everything that is in our hearts, who's got all power. It might be kind of fearful to look on that kind of God unless we also knew he was all loving. The Bible says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He was so loving that he gave his very best. In spite of the fact the world was sinful in rebellion against his holy God, he loved us so much that he gave his own son for us. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16 says, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. God is love. It is of the very essence of love. 
sometimes people say if God is love then why is there a hell think of two people standing under a waterfall each has a cup in his hand one has the cup turned right side up and saying my cup is full and running over the other one has his cup upside down and says my life is empty and meaningless I can't keep anything in it what's the difference between the two people not the Niagara Falls not the waterfalls that's flowing over what's different is that one has his cup up and is receiving this love the other has his cup down and is rejecting it God loves everyone the just and the unjust he makes his sun to shine upon atheists and believers God makes grass to grow and food to grow for believer and unbeliever alike he opens his hand to provide the desire of every living thing Psalm 104 says and Acts 14 declares that God is the God who provides everything in its season for all people he is an all-loving God and he loves everyone the difference is that some are receiving that love and some are rejecting it but he loves them nonetheless